Good morning. Good morning. Hope everyone is doing well this morning. Um, this is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice. All right. Is that really how we want to fill in the blank this morning? Or is it endure or get a nap? It's dreary outside. We're here, right? Uh, exactly. A lot to be grateful for, a lot to be thankful for. So welcome, welcome all. Um, the announcements you'll find in your bulletin and the insert, just a couple things to point out. Men's breakfast next Sunday, 8 a.m. So mark your calendars to attend that. And also a friendly reminder in regards to that, or in addition to that, to bring a non-perishable good, um, canned good, something along those lines, um, for the, the food pantry. Also, the Sunday school books, Beth has ordered those and they can be found on the table in the narthex. So pick up one of those on your way out today. Um, and I'll try to tell you about this one without butchering it up too much. Um, there's a, a drive-through um, vaccination that's gonna take place next Friday on February the 5th. And this is gonna take place at Roberts Chapel Church and is sponsored through the Chatham County Health Department. Um, there's no guarantee that you can be seen, um, but there are forms here that you can fill out if you're interested. It's for those persons that are 65 and older. And if you're interested in the potential of getting your vaccination or your um, COVID shot on that day, you can fill this out and leave it in the back and Susie Miller is gonna come by today and pick these up and take them to, um, I think it's Mr. and Mrs. Womble who are kind of sponsoring that event or helping with that event through Robert's Chapel. So again, there are forms here to be completed. It's just basic information to give you a chance and opportunity um, for the shot. And then what happens is if, you're, if there's room available and shots available, um, then the health department will contact you uh, from the information that you provide on the, the sheet. So anyway, this is, I guess, similar to buying a lottery ticket. There's no guarantee you're gonna be given a shot. I don't know if that's exactly like winning the lottery, getting a shot, but I hope you get the gist of what I'm trying to say. Kyle, you probably tell them better than I can. <laughs> Any other announcements for the good of the group? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And if they haven't given enough for 2020, you'll be staying at the back to for them to make up the difference today before they leave and face the rain. Correct. All right. I like that. Pretty good strategy, right, Steve? Yeah. That's Janelle's now. Janelle's a good strategy. It's always good. There's a female in charge, so you know how that works. Good job. Uh, anything else for the good of the group? Again, it's a uh, Rainy day, but guess what? It's not all that bad when you think of the grand scheme of things. And as we were having choir practice earlier and talking about all the different prayer requests, um, we have a lot to be grateful for. And being here and being able to worship and serve a great God, the one and true only God, is a great thing. So let's rejoice and have a great day of worship together. Thank you. church. I have to say that. Praise to the Lord. We will give thanks to the Lord with our whole heart. Full of honor and majesty is his work and his righteousness endures forever. 
thanks for Francis and CC having wonderful words, many, many, many words to say about all creatures of our God and King. That was beautiful for us to sing all of those words. I guess I was the one that chose it, so I was the one that made you do that. Let us continue to stand and join together in our opening prayer. Everlasting God, as your people wandered in the wilderness, they asked for a prophet to lead them. You responded time and time again with someone to interpret and share your good news with all who would listen. Today we find ourselves wandering again. Might you send your Holy Spirit to guide us and lead us to everlasting life. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated.
this time I invite all who would like to take their children to the nursery, that you can follow our nursery volunteers at this time down there. And as we give them time to go to the nursery and make their way back, I invite you to join with me in our hymn of preparation, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, hymn number 127.
who are very happy to have a church community, a faith community to connect with during these trying times. And I know that our worship service is reaching people here in the community because I cannot walk into Rufus's or Lizzie's or Dollar General without somebody saying to me, Preacher, that was a great word you brought last week. <laughs> Pastor, I love that prayer that you said the other day. And the kicker is that I don't have a clue who any of these people are, which is, all, which is a blessing and a curse at the same time. Because I love to call people by their name. We all love to be called by our name. I've said that before with us. Being called by our name reminds us that we are not invisible. Being called by your name, being recognized for who you are, means that others see you for who you are. Calling each other by name is a sign of respect and affection. And I want to get to know who these people are in our community that we are reaching in this way during this time. In this sermon series, we are remembering that our God calls us by name, and we in turn are to respond. We are hearing scriptures of old about God calling out to his people, calling out to his creation, and in turn, they respond. Samuel was asleep in the temple and God called out to him four times before he finally awoke from his sleep, awoke from his dormant faith, and lived into this calling that God had put on his life, how he responded by becoming a priest. Last week we heard about Jonah and the Ninevites both heard the word of the Lord call out to them and they responded in very different ways. Jonah at first turned and ran away from the call before he finally submitted to it and went to Nineveh. But the Ninevites heard the call of the Lord and responded immediately with repentance resulting in God's mercy. Today we just heard another story that Janelle read for us from our scriptures where Jesus is surrounded by people who do not recognize him for who he is, but yet an unclean spirit does and calls him by name. To put our scripture in context, Jesus has just called his first four disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. They had heard Jesus call out to them to lay down their nets and follow him. And their first stop on this ministry tour that Jesus was going on was in the town of Capernaum. At this time, Capernaum was a thriving town of great wealth. It was a headquarters of many Roman troops. There were pagan influences that abounded throughout the town. So this was a great place for Jesus to do his first stop in ministry to challenge both Jews and non-Jews alike. According to the Gospel of Mark, Jesus makes his first public ministry action, teaching in the synagogue. It was common at this time for great teachers to travel around from city to city, town to town, to teach in the synagogue. So this was not unusual for somebody to do. Most visiting rabbis would teach and interpret scripture by leaning on the traditions that they had of the past, leaning on the prophets of old. For example, for example, a teacher of this time would lead their lesson by saying, so and so prophet once said this about our scripture, which makes us read it in this way, which gets us to this thing that we should take with us. That was kind of the way that they taught their lessons during that time. The rabbis and Pharisees and scribes would use a lot of third-person language. He said, she said type of language. Jesus stood up and taught with authority. While we don't hear any of Jesus' lesson in our passage this morning, we have to imagine that his words that he shared with them probably sounded a lot like all the other words that we hear Jesus say later on in his ministry the rabbis would say, this is the way, this is the truth, this is the life. Jesus stood up and said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. The Pharisees would say, this is the way, these are the things that you have to do in order to get into heaven. 
Jesus says, no one gets into heaven except through me. The scribes would tell stories of ages past. Jesus told stories of that time. He told stories that people could connect to. And we hear that the people are astounded. You can almost hear the church ladies gossiping at lunch after the service was over. Who is this nice young man that came to teach with us today? He teaches with great authority. He, I love his passion, his energy. I can hear everything that he is saying. Being a guest teacher, a guest preacher in a community is tough work. You have to prove yourself a little bit. You have to keep people engaged. But you also have to find that balance between knowledge and passion, story and lecture, tradition and freshness. I had the opportunity a few years ago to guest preach at a church in Selma, North Carolina. And it was an odd experience to write a sermon for a group of people that you do not know. A group of people that you do, that you do not know their likes and dislikes. You do not know what it is that they are struggling with, what it is that they are joyful about. You don't know their demographics. You don't know what examples are going, going to work and what examples aren't going to work. In some ways, being a guest preacher, guest teacher, it could be kind of fun because you could just say whatever you want to say and let the usual person deal with all the mess that you leave behind. But I chose that day to be respectful to my friend who had granted me the opportunity to fill his shoes that Sunday. So to use the language that Tia likes to use for me, I didn't give them the full Nelson. I just gave them a little bit to keep things interesting on that day. But Jesus, on the other hand, on this day in the synagogue, must have brought it. The people in the synagogue were astounded by what they heard Jesus saying. No one had spoken about the scriptures in this way before. No one had interpreted scriptures like this to them before. No one made scripture come alive in their hearts the way it did that day. Just who might be this teacher? The people in the synagogue hung on every word of the lesson that Jesus brought all the way until the final amen. But the lesson wasn't done yet. At the end of the lesson, a man from within the community stands up and we hear that he is overcome by an unclean spirit. Now, an unclean spirit is defined as any spirit that is not of God. This evil spirit that is dictating his life, dictating his speech, forcing him to act in ways that he never would if the unclean spirit didn't exist. Here stood this man filled with an unclean spirit, opposing a man, Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit. The battle against good and evil coming to terms right there on the synagogue floor in front of the entire community. The unclean spirit shouts out from the man, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. The Holy One of God. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. The people in the synagogue had heard Jesus preach and teach, and they had no idea who he was. But this unclean spirit, this personified evil in their presence, calls Jesus by name, knows what power he holds, and knows what his relationship is to God. The scribes and teachers of the law who were present that day did not recognize Jesus standing before them. Those who were well read in the scriptures, those who had been faithful all their lives, those that had been waiting on this Messiah to come like God had promised, were looking at him and did not recognize him for who he was. The God who can call out to evil spirits, rids them from our lives, was standing before them. And they did not recognize him for who he was. 
but the unclean spirit knew. The unclean spirit recognized Jesus. He called him by name, and he responded when Jesus came before him. Church, evil recognizes good when he is standing before it. Evil recognizes good when it is threatening its existence. So often in life, we are given the opportunity to choose between right and wrong. And because of our sinful nature and the power that the devil has over our lives, many times we choose the wrong, even when we know that the right leads to life. We choose the easy life of evil rather than the difficult life of good. We choose the safety of the known rather than the unknown that leads to goodness. We choose the life of comfort rather than the life of struggle. And when we have an unclean spirit working on our lives, we can tell when goodness draws near. Because evil digs in its claws, does it not? Evil tries to rear its ugly head, try to show its power over us, making it so much harder to rid it of our lives. Trying, making it so much harder to have us lean into the goodness of God. It makes it so much harder to turn away from the evil. This unclean spirit had been living within this man for who knows how long. It had been wrecking his life, wrecking the lives of those around him. And when Jesus comes and stands before him, the unclean spirit recognizes the good and is fearful of it. The unclean spirit knows that it does not stand a chance against the power of God. The unclean spirit knows that their subject will be forever changed by these words that Jesus has to say. And so trying to save its own life, the unclean spirit has the audacity to challenge Jesus. It calls out to Jesus, and Jesus responds. Our scripture tells us that Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, saying, Be quiet! Come out of him. Be quiet, worry and doubt. Come out of him. Be quiet, anxiousness and fear. Come out of her. Be quiet, sin and evil. Come out of her them. And the unclean spirit comes out of the man with convulsions and loud cries because church, we know that evil does not go quietly into that good night. If the Sunday school lesson that Jesus was teaching wasn't astonishing enough to some people, this exorcism of this evil spirit had to have done it for them. Because we hear that people are amazed and Jesus' fame begins to spread throughout the region of Galilee. The Gospels are filled with stories of how Jesus' words and actions bring about a response. With his words, Jesus calls a raging storm in the sea. Call and response. Jesus lays his hands on the eyes of a blind man, and his sight is returned. Call and response. Jesus blesses five loaves and two fish, and it becomes food to feed 5,000 people. Call and response. Some of these responses that we hear in Scripture are miraculous types of responses. But other times, these responses are mundane, unseen, unwritten about like today, we don't know who this man was who had this evil spirit exercised from him. We don't know who he was or what he became. But we have to believe that having had the evil exercised from his life, he lived a life of great response. A life that was forever transformed because he met Jesus face to face. Jesus' mere presence in the synagogue that day brought about a response from all who witnessed. Rumors began to spread. Astonishment and wonder began to stir within the hearts and minds of the community. 
Jesus' presence in the world demanded a response. Reading this passage this week, it made me wonder, what kind of response would I have if Jesus walked into this church today? What kind of response would we have if Jesus stood before us and called out to the evil and shunned it from our life? Would we count it as a blessing or would we think he was the crazy one? Would we even recognize him if he walked up to us and called us by name? Would we even be able to call him by name? In Methodism, we talk about this amazing grace that we have been gifted from God, this prevenient, justifying, sanctifying grace. This grace that is at work in our life before we even recognize it for what it is. This grace that washes away our sins when we commit to a life in Christ. This grace that sustains us and pushes us onward toward Christian perfection. We as the people called Methodists call this grace responsible grace. Responsible grace. This grace that has been given to us as a gift that we are now responsible with using properly. This grace that has been given to us out of love that we are now responsible with treating others with love. This grace that has been given to us that gives us the response ability, response-able grace. Because friends, this presence of Christ in this world demands a response. The presence of Christ in our life demands a response. The presence of Christ within this church demands a response. And the response is a transformation of our very nature that leads to us living a life of love and grace for the world. The people of Capernaum on this day had Jesus standing before them, and they did not recognize him for who he was. Church, our living God comes and stands among us this day and every day that we gather together as a church. He calls out to the evil of our lives and he denounces it. He calls out to the demons of our minds and tells them to be quiet. He calls out to the unclean spirits within us and eradicates them, filling us with his Holy Spirit. Every week before I preach, I pray the same prayer where I say, come Holy Spirit and fill this space. Sit down beside us. Stir among us. Make us anew. I pray those words because I believe that is what happens when God, when we find ourselves in the presence of God. Transformation. Make us anew. Make this community anew. Come Holy Spirit and make this world anew. Friends, we are a people who God is calling out to. Calling out with his words, calling out with his actions, calling out with his presence. And he is demanding a response. A response of mercy towards the world and one another. A response of compassion towards ourselves. A response of love to the God who first loved us. An unclean spirit was able to recognize Jesus when he came face to face with him. How much more so should we be able to recognize Jesus when he shows up in our lives? Might we be transformed by his presence? Might his words stir us to faithfulness? Might his actions become our actions as we respond with our whole being to this responsible grace that we have been given? May it be so. Amen? Amen. Amen.
At this time, I invite you to stand as you are able, as we respond with the historic affirmation of our faith, the Apostles' Creed, which you can find on page 881 in your hymnals, in your bulletin, or on the screen. Church, I ask you, what is it that you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From the man shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the rest. Maybe see. transition now into a time of prayer. Let us continue to be in prayer for our nation and our leaders. We want to continue to be in prayer for all of those who are affected by COVID-19, both those that we know and many that we may not know during this time. We want to continue to be in prayer for these vaccine efforts as we should continue to hope for a sense of normalcy sometime soon. We want to continue to be in prayer for Mick Hughes and his family and the death of his grandfather. Be in prayer for Dan Jones, brother-in-law to Suzanne Walks Jones, as he goes through treatments for cancer. We want to continue to be in prayer for our Antioch church family and the death of Dr. Ken Harris this week and prayers for his family. I know that there are many other concerns that are heavy on our hearts today, those, both those that have been said aloud to those of us who um, know that those that we've sent out this week, and even those concerns that have been left unsaid, for there are many in our lives. Just a reminder to continue to send those prayer requests in if you would like them to be shared with the community. And also remember to grab some of these prayer shawls that are up here. If you know somebody that is in need of prayer, it's a great opportunity um, to share those with the community. So let us go to God in prayer at this time. Almighty God, we come to you today with prayers that you come and stand among us. That your presence come and transform this place. Transform our hearts, transform this community, transform this world into what you see it should be. Lord, rid out the evil of our lives. Rid out the evil of this community. Rid out the evil of this world. Strengthen us to be your hands and feet. To be a light in a world of darkness. To be a hand that builds up, that doesn't tear down. To be a hand that reaches out when the world turns away. To be your love 
in a world that is in desperate need of it. Lord, we give thanks that you are a God who doesn't leave us in our time of need. That you came to live among us, to be with us, to hold our hands, to cry on our shoulder, to teach us how to live and how to love. Lord, it's because of your presence that we know we can pray to you wholeheartedly, that we can pray audaciously for these things in our life, that we know that you will listen and you will answer in the way that you know so well. Lord, we lift those concerns to you at this time that are heavy on our hearts. Lord, we give thanks that you hear everything that is on our heart before we can even speak it aloud. As we're about to pray this prayer of confession together, Lord, help us to remember that we are a work in progress. But we give thanks that you are a God who loves us anyway. That you love us even despite our failures. Help us to love one another despite their failures. Lord, we pray these words of confession together. Say, merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. I pray that the peace of Christ go with you, not only this day, but forevermore. Amen. At this time, I invite you to stand as you are able and join in singing our him of response, great is thy faithfulness.
church here that's been addiction, that God loves you. And there ain't nothing that you can do about it except to let that love live inside of you and to go out into this community, into this world, and share that love with everyone that you meet. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go now in peace. Amen. Amen.